I noticed there was a lot less whooping when I came up, um, and I, I, I feel very offended by that. I find that deeply offensive. Thank you. Not to be whooped at. So um, I wanted to say to the German and French comrades, and especially to the Indians and the Americans, welcome to Europe. This is um, Herodotus. Um, before the Christian era, 450. Libya, we've made a mess of that. Saudi, we don't like them very much. Persia, they're looking good the last couple of weeks. India, we civilized them. <coughs> uh, and China, of course, never made any contribution to world civilization. So um, it's great to be here in Par uh, Brighton. Um, and in fact, uh, I was at Sussex University before all of you were born, and I thought, now I've returned to Brighton, I'll, I'll kind of notice the local sites and then participate in litter collection. I did that this morning. Uh, it's a Guinness, which I didn't drink. And uh, I just wanted to say that I was talking with Katie from the Home Office last night, and one thing we agreed on was the level of historical amnesia out there, how much people really understand better than they should the history of UX. And I just thought, to blow my own trumpet there, that's, I can't remember when it was, it's kind of 1982 when I was editor of design, and already the trend towards a service economy, IT, uh, interaction design and so on was already clear then, even if I called it product intelligibility. So don't bother to look me up in history, but I think acquainting yourself with history is important to understanding the future. So just about myself, I went to Philips. I was head of worldwide market intelligence at Philips Consumer Electronics in Eindhoven, the Netherlands, the Milton Keynes of the Low Countries, <laughs> the, um, the Columbus, Ohio of the Orange State. And on the left is Harrop Phillips. He invented everything. They marketed nothing. On the right were my colleagues at Philips, which is why I had to leave the company. Uh, but then uh, I did a book on construction, uh, technology, future of innovation. That's what I do. It got me a threatening phone call from this man, so it can't have been all bad. And then I did a book on energy. If you go to Amazon, it's at the head of a list of books called Energize Your Sex Life. It's got nothing to do with that. <laughs> so that's enough about me. Now, the first part of this talk, you're not going to like it. You're not going to like it one bit. But the bits you do like it should be attributed to Danny. And the bits you don't like, you please troll me. Uh, if you can spell my name, come after me. I'm, I'm waiting for you. But um, this boilerplate bit is really strictly from Danny, before I enter the polemics and all of that. And he just said what you've been hearing about more and more and what uh, Emma was just hinting at and all of the rest of it, the longer-term perspective for your profession is that you move up through the craft of research, through maybe research ops, we've heard about that, and then you're consulted by the management more and more, you've got higher responsibilities, and eventually uh, you become a chief design officer. It could be a chief creative officer, it could be a chief interface officer, I don't know. And that, I just want to say, there's two developments that are behind that, just looking at the future of your own profession and trying to persuade you not to fall asleep before I finish. And the first of them is about what the uh, head of Accor Hotels says, is chucking out the legacy systems and the legacy management models that they've had and becoming much more agile, or what our American friends would call agile, uh, in the sense of a, a hostile missile. Uh, anyway, <laughs> never mind about that. And why is everybody in business and your clients and your management talking about agility? And there's some simple reasons. Some of them are to do with IT. Um, there's a rise, uh, as you may know, from 2001 onwards of agile software. Uh, there's development operations, there's research op ops, and that's all made sort of speed and suppleness become more important in terms of how you do programming and how you do research. If you look at the wonderful reception that startups get in the media and elsewhere, part of their reputation is that unlike lumbering giants, 
They are free of silos. You know, the silos are just around the same table, so they can keep their options open. They can make quick decisions. So the challenge to incumbents, ladies and gentlemen, from startups has also embodied the promise of agility. And another thing to do with it is that with capitalism today, don't want to sound too radical, but with capitalism today, it's much easier to take over another company than it is to get out a really great new product. So you'll find that since the downturn of 2008-9, the volume of mergers and acquisitions activity, of moving around the world to take things over and so on, has actually grown. And the latest figures, even superior to these, suggest that it will get to a record-breaking half a trillion dollars this year. It's already uh, moving up very quickly. So you've got another factor, which is that firms want to be able to move around the world, get in, get out, uh, and, you know, close down subsidiaries, open up new subsidiaries, especially when they're in takeover mode. One factor I've forgotten in the last few weeks, I'm going to make this a bit interactive, what would you say had hit the headlines in the last few weeks, or the last year or so, that Im impelled management to think agility? Any offers? Sorry? Brexit. Yeah, well, we're keeping off that here, but anything else? <laughs> Anything else? Well, it's broadly these kinds of developments, right? The Khashoggi affair, the Trump trade wars, the Bolsonaro victory in Brazil, uh, the problems between China and even British and French ships in the South China Sea suggest that it's geopolitical and market volatility, because you've also had a very rapid decline of the uh, Dow Jones in the last uh, few days, really, beginning with tech stocks, as they're called, or more accurately, IT stocks in America. This general release of post-Brexit, post-Trump, uh, post-everything, really, uh, conflicts between Erdogan and the Saudis and the Americans and all of the rest of it, makes management more nervous and more concerned whether it has the sinews of agility for the turbulent period ahead. So, when we do a boring English dictionary definition lookup, which I hate, nevertheless, uh, you know, it's got its um, reasonable merits in the case of agility. We've got these reasons behind it, which I've just given you. What is it exactly? Well, I mentioned sinuousness. It's also about reach. It's about nimbleness and quickness. And it's also about sort of uh, being agile at a micro level. So basically, one's metaphor in management, the reason they're kind of what they're thinking about when they say, I want an agile corporation by Monday, please. Uh, they're thinking this sort of thing. But what they're missing is that that's all right for gymnasts, but it's uh, in the case of athletes, it's not quite the whole deal. If you take Mo Farah, he's watching his competitors. He's watching his opponents. He's psyching them out. He's working out their strengths and weaknesses. So it's got a physical element, but it's also got what Samuel Johnson hinted at, which is the quality of being speedily put in motion. It's the, the whole caboodle of just not your arms and your reach and so on, but your ability to mobilize that very fast. And that isn't, ladies and gentlemen, just a question of sense and respond. It's also a question, particularly now, of apprehending, of anticipating, of forecasting. It's both a physical thing, agility for companies, if you like, and also a mental thing. We heard about knowledge management already today. That's very relevant. We even heard an old quote I hadn't heard for a bit of uh, time by a way old CEO of Hewlett Packard, if only we knew what we knew. A rather important guide to sort of the merit, I believe, of research ops. So what I'm here to do to tell you is that uh, if we do begin our forecasting, we can see that there's a broad trend for management to demand a sort of higher mindset and a faster response and a better anticipation, better forecasting of you so that they know which market to enter, which users to get close to, which ones to abandon. That's what they think agility is. That's what they'll be asking you about. And that means that your view of the future, ladies and gentlemen, needs to become more professional. We've heard a lot about a number of buzzwords which I'm not going to attack, but they're often to do with inclusion and diversity and all of these things. That's fine at one level. What we're not hearing enough about 
particularly, is what the whole demand for agility is actually reflecting, which is something that maybe your future conferences can, can discuss a bit more, and that is the productivity crisis in the West. What the demand for agility and the demand for you to act up uh, is all about is that we haven't had the productivity growth in the last 10 years, especially since the financial crisis, that we enjoyed in the post-war boom, not at all, and even in periods subsequent to the end of the Cold War in 1989 to 91. Productivity is the reason why you're all working long hours, low productivity. And it's not just me that said that, it's our wonderful friend Philip Hammond just before the budget, so it must be true. So I think it's important that you look at the long-term trends, the bigger picture, and that you understand agility as a kind of messed up response to the fact that we're not getting the snap with growth, productivity, mechanization, automation, efficiency, customer convenience, or customer service. I know I'm from London and that in Brighton already disqualifies me. But if you're talking customer service, if you want to make a call out of King's Cross on a Friday night, you'll be you know, waiting quite a bit of time. So it's that productivity problem that I think UX will have to face when it, the managers come along and ask you for agility. That's kind of on the economics management side. There is, however, a higher problem, which is also going to lead, as marketing people say, to an opportunity for you all, Dan has hinted at it, and the opportunity to move on up, and that is the sociological crisis of legitimacy that management in the West is suffering. And, you know, that means that they're often directionless, and they're going to come to you for direction. Right? When the emperor has no clothes, that's when the UXers can move in and move up. Well, some of you got that joke, but uh, all right. So if you look at the legitimacy problems faced by management, uh, it's quite remarkable. Just, you know, nearly every year, some household names, you know, and also the, most recently the Merkel Coalition and its promotion of a top spook to uh, even higher jobs in the civilian world, something similar has just happened in Britain, in fact, with the, uh, with the civil service, you'll see that people are nervous about large organizations in a way that they were not when things went better with Coke or you came alive for the Pepsi generation. And underneath all of those worries about particular culprits are wider fears that you know, we're not getting the growth, we're not getting the wage increases, we are unclear about what management wants, uh, we're not certain that it's got a plan B for some of the wacky things that tend to happen in the turbulent teenies. So the credibility gap for management is bigger, and that gap can be filled by designers more and more. This is Mark Parker, the head of uh, Nike. He, became, he moved from chief design officer to chief executive officer around 2006. So that's broadly, you may not get to CEO just yet, but you're broadly going to be asked to be CDO on the board over the next five to 10 years. And in fact, I did a secret um, adolescent Wikipedia search for chief design officers. It laid bare about eight or nine. When I did a bit more work, uh, it was quite remarkable just how many there are around the world in leading corporations, at least 30 or 50. And that's quite, so, quite recently. The Wikipedia page only began uh, just a few years ago. So that's the direction your profession is headed. Um, and in fact, you might have a look at this book, a rather irreverent book from the 70s, you know, when dinosaurs ruled the earth uh, in 1971. It's all about sort of what to be aware of as this process happens to you. So uh, that's to sum up, just in terms of your prospects and where things are going, there's fairly good grounds for believing that you're all going to get a lot more money in the future, going to get a lot more seniority, don't be as legless as the current management. That's all I ask. And it means that you've got to broaden and deepen and raise your skills. And one of the skills that uh, we, we need to think about is moving from the tactical up to strategic. Whenever I hear that word, strategic, I have to vomit because I, I myself I only do tactical work you know, for the last 40 years. But does anybody know who this man is on this question? 
please? Any Germans? <coughs> Sorry? Who? Uh, well, it didn't sound quite right. And what was that one at the front? Clausewitz. Ah, Clausewitz. Very good. Yes, Karl von Clausewitz. He systematized on his uh, book, Von Krieger on War, the distinction between strategy and tactics. Tactics is winning the battle. Strategy is winning the war. Now, we should avoid military metaphors in thinking about corporate strategy and tactics, but you get the point. To win the war, you have to be thinking long term, not just this year's UX research, but the next two, five, ten years in research generally. So I think what comes out of this, just this opening se session is, section is that you, you know, you've got great prospects. You've got to read more widely. Maybe read a whole book from cover to cover. <laughs> you know, I, I, know that, I know that makes me a fascist and everything, you know, and, and I do have personality problems, but just if you would occasionally read a whole book, you know, the bigger picture, economic and even more sociologically, is very important. We're going to interrogate some categories in a minute. And, you know, understanding history not as musty lessons, but as understanding the history, the grandeur of your profession, the romance of UX. You can't do that just by being hip in the moment, right? You won't last a minute. You've got to understand, you know, the greats and uh, uh, people like that in the history of your profession. All right, now, now, if I could just get a glass of water before I die, we're going to go into the difficult bit where you're all going to hate me. All right. Uh, but in fact, brilliantly, Will Middleton and Emma also have sort of sketched the element of skepticism that you need more of, I think, in your work. And everybody needs more. So we're going to get to that. I just want to underline, many of you may be in B2B markets, which in my judgment are more important than B2C markets. But if we stick with B2C, we could go into all of the tr uh, kind of types of research that you can do to research consumers. And this is on my website. And we've got ethnography there. That was all you know, hit back in 2006. And in fact, in the 80s, uh, if you really look at it, it's not what it was then. Today, of course, but the term is, became hit for designers. Bill Mogridge, before he uh, uh, founded IDEO, that, that, there are different research techniques that you can, can use, and you know some of them better than me. Emma touched on some of them. There are also, at the desk, important think tanks on the future. And this isn't in my recommendations. I'm cautious with Will about recommendations. But actually, I do recommend that you collect and suspect more of these forecasts, right? Grab them and then diss them or, you know, balance them up. That's the thing. And there are all sorts of sources for this. This is the EU's barometer on uh, consumer opinion and so on. Watch out for the axes, everybody, because it might be rising, but you will see it has still to pretty much re reach 50% uh, are confident about the future, 50% are unconfident, because, in fact, the balance especially since the financial crisis, has been pretty negative. It's only now, um, before the Merkel administration fell, that we're seeing sort of seeing even Stevens in opinions about the future, uh, cold from the desk and Euro monitor, or uh, in fact, in this case, the European Commission. So you can get all of that. It's not very difficult. You're probably quite good at it. You should become very good at it. But it won't tell you what customer goals are. This data that we discussed treats customers very much in the way that Will so brilliantly attacked in the opening part of his three-part sandwich, the dogma of consumer needs, that it's all about consumer uh, wants, needs, desires, requirements, whether they're latent, whether they're overt. We heard it all before, what it's missing is that we live in a rather different kind of world, although we often forget this, one where human beings <coughs> are not just needy animals, but creative actors upon the world. Agents, autonomous agents, no matter how duped or stupid we may be, 
We're able to control our environment and the world we live in more than lovely furry animals. I like lovely furry animals, but we got something that they haven't got. On this note, does anybody know who this man is? You've all talked about him. Very few of you have read him. Anybody know who he is? Very good, Maslow. And here he is, and if you read his paper in the September 1943 issue of the Psychological Review, which is freely available on the web, you'll find that the man who gave all of these wanky marketing people, take that out of the tape. Uh, the, <laughs> The, the, the pyramid of, you know, hierarchy of consumer needs, right? Ugh, if I see another pyramid, I'm going to die. If you read his paper, you'll actually find, first of all, he's always talking about basic needs. Could the fact that it was 1943 have anything to do with that, you know? And second of all, he doesn't regard people just as needy animals. He recognizes their human potential, their human capabilities. That was in uh, one of the recent talks that we've had. So I just want to underline for you, in terms of the imperatives, that even in B2B markets, and certainly in B2C markets, we're not just dealing with needs. Uh, we're dealing with what Tony Blair, I'm afraid, would call aspirations, but we're dealing with objectives. Where do they want to go in life? And uh, with their capabilities in all of that, their purpose uh, in, in, with a particular task. Maybe you know all this stuff, but the marketing people I run into you know, they still want to do that, if you were an animal, would you be a cheater kind of thing. I, I, I can't be on that. Now, here's the difficult bit, right? We've had some of these at the conference. If I attack them, it isn't that they're completely wrong. It's just that I hear them too much. Actually, the conference has been mercifully full, uh, empty of buzzwords, but I want to reinforce to you how important it is to take a critical attitude to what we take for granted. The conventional wisdom just won't suffice. You're the youth. It's time to, con to confront and challenge the conventional wisdom, especially if you're part of it. Especially if you're part of it. So, in fact, all the sort of buzzword stuff has been going, I think that's 1986 in Business Week there, and you'll see touchy-feely managers are very hip, uh, even then. But I think one of the buzzwords that we're always hearing about, <coughs> excuse me, is uncertainty. Nearly every forecaster, except me, begins the speech by saying, you know something, the future's completely uncertain. I'll know if, you know, I never hear another speech on forecasting because it always will begin with, you know, certainly it will begin with the fact of uncertainty. What a bore, you know? And then we usually get this guy Right, about the knowns, and the known unknowns, and then the unknown unknowns, Donald Rumsfeld, right? What the hell is an unknown unknown? You can spend the whole of Friday evening going to, trying to toss and turn in your bed. I, I just can't grasp those unknown unknowns, you know? And all of the, at the end of it, all you know is you don't know. <laughs> so I hate, I, it's so boring. And I, let me tell you something. I'm 95% confident that tomorrow will be Saturday. You know, it could go either way, right? but you know, even after the disco tonight, it's probably going to, the sun's going to rise and most of you are going to feel grumpy and all of this. So uncertainty is overdone. And also the sort of tripwire to a tipping point to an uh, explosion of something or other is also overdone because we have the impotent sensation that events are running out of control. I'm not sure that's true. And certainly we tend to uh, move into a metaphysical plane where even if you believe in climate change, and my book on energy is all about believing in it to many degrees, nevertheless, it doesn't follow that you know um, one thing will lead to another. You'll get a ladder of ex escalation, as they used to talk about it in nuclear theory in the 60s. We've already gone past Prince Charles's estimable scientific uh, predictions and his forecasting, right? Any Republicans here? No. All right. Well, that makes me a minority of one, but I don't buy it. I don't buy his account uh, any more than I like him talking to plants. So I want to say that, you know, 
yeah, the future is a bit uncertain, but not that uncertain. Yeah, it is moving ahead a bit faster, but if I hear that another time, I'm going to be off that bus. And really, the second thing that's very much connected with that, we only heard it once, I think, this morning, is exponential disruption. I hate that. I wonder how many mathematicians know the difference between linear, polynomial, and exponential growth. Right? I'll tell you one thing, they all end in infinity. So if you think UX is growing exponentially, back off a bit, right? because you're not going to take over world population anytime soon. What is also, what's genuinely growing exponentially is the use of the word exponential. <laughs> right? right? If you actually read Gordon Moore's 1962-ish paper, 65, I think it was, on Moore's law, he doesn't mention the word law anywhere in that paper, right? To make it exponential growth a law of physics, of semiconductors, of UX growth, of anything, uh, is really to follow in the tradition of Malthus, who always was worried about the exponential growth of population, in particular, working class people breeding like rabbits. So do watch out for exponential disruption. Now, there's one that has been used just this morning, um, which nobody ever critiques. I had to do a lot of work out on to find out what it was all about. And that word is stakeholders, or as you might say, stakeholders, schmakeholders, right? And it all begins, like a lot of stuff does, in the peak years of the Cold War, in the 60s, a Cuban Missile Crisis, integrated circuit, the laser, uh, all of these things, discovery of climate change. And um, with some of our great heroes, like Doug Douglas Engelbart, it first emerged in an internal me memo in the Stanford Research Institute on the West Coast. And uh, yeah, 63, there we are. So, what I'm doing is I'm looking at the history, the etymology, and the intellectual history of this category that all rolls off your tongue, but I don't think does justice to a world where some stakeholders have power and some do not. I hate to make an elementary point. I don't want to sound like a boring old leftist with the Corbyn you know, jersey and all the rest of it, but an employer is not a stakeholder in the same way as an employee is, right? Call me old-fashioned, and nor is a user, in fact. And then it moved out from the 60s, and eventually it got to the academic world. I think, when's this, 1983? Yeah, already the language was getting more difficult, and um, you missed that one. Uh, and uh, then, but it still didn't have legs. It only really got legs when we moved from the Reagan era to the Clinton feel your pain era. And once you were feeling everybody's pain, of course, you had to feel all the stakeholders' pain as well. In the Reagan era, nobody, it was all shareholders, not stakeholders. In the Clinton era, stakeholders grew. And then I drew up a little table, number of mentions. I went through all the presidential speeches of, of late, searching for the words, uh, word stakeholder. And you can see the growth in the Clinton era. Surprisingly, you can see quite a lot of usage by George W. Bush. Probably none by Trump just yet, but you know, Barack Obama went really overboard on it. Now, do we buy it? I don't buy it. Right? I would at least discriminate between stakeholders. Now, here's another one that we didn't hear today, which you didn't use, which is to your credit, but is an important one. Seamless. Seamless. <laughs> I spent weeks looking for a male swimsuit, because I knew if I showed a, a female, was it something I said? Uh, no, well. Um, <laughs> I knew if I showed a female one, I'd probably be run out of Brighton and never speak here again. So I got a mail. And let me tell you, in 2,000 years, Italian tailors have not made a seamless suit. You know, the reality of UX and nearly everything else is that uh, your picture goes down just when you, uh, uh, when you were wanting it. But it may come on again. Here we are. Yeah. We got that? Yeah. So the reality is much more like this, as you and I know. Right? And again, I was talking to Katie yesterday about the Home Office. Home Office is not alone in having what we at Phillips called organizational spaghetti. Right? So two simple recommendations, they're not in the text, which you will see on my website and you can grab from me, is you need fewer meetings. You need fewer internal 
memos and internal emails, right, in order to begin to sort out the enormous legacy spaghetti that is in large organizations now. So never describe an IT system, especially at King's Cross on a Friday night, as seamless. That doesn't exist. In fact, I'm detecting my IT, Apple and all, is more and more unable to sync diaries, to sync between devices, and da da da. I got a physics degree. You know, I'm a professor. And I think the productivity of IT is actually going down. And me, as a user, I might be wrong, but the perception is there. Now, here's another word just to, just to clarify what are we dealing with when we're trying to be reasonably opt optimistic about IT, but not having Silicon Valley snake oil coming out of our earlobes and so on. One of the ones that we do need to avoid is the metaphor of space. You are not in the IT space. You are not in the UX space. And those of you who ever did interior design, please don't say, I'm in the space space, right? Because <laughs> it won't do. You know, the, the metaphor of, you know, we're in a space with electrons, IT, networks, and so on, or in management, or in business. No. It's a metaphor. A metaphor is the comparison of things that are different. Just as businesses are not biological entities, they are not in a space. Right? So be careful with that because it will mislead you. And it does mislead people. Much more misleading, conspicuously absent in today's proceedings, which I'm delighted about, is what is called artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, you know? And it's quite remarkable, the paper that runs the country, the Guardian, is convinced that it's already here, everywhere. It's all around us, you know, a bit like microbead plastic or endocrine disruptors in the kitchen or Russian bots. You know, you, you can't see it, but AI's there, you know, and it's probably bad shit going down. <laughs> you know. Please, do me a favor. You know, it's not there. And what always seems to escape these people is even the much-touted IBM... Uh, knowledge and artificial intelligence system that they, they pioneered in all of it, whose name now escapes me. What is it somebody said? Sorry? Watson. Watson. Yeah, the, named after the founder of IBM. It's not working very well. It hasn't got a cure for cancer. It's having problems. I want us to move in that direction. But uh, let's not call it artificial intelligence. What we're calling it is clever software. Clever software, that, fair enough. It augments human intelligence, but it can't always replace it. So let's avoid that one. Quickly, we're on the last leg on the bad concepts. Can we not talk about tech-savvy digital native millennials? Right? <laughs> because, actually, they may be tech-savvy, but if you have a look at the middle bars, right, AI is helping the 18 to 25-year-olds, what's called AI. Yeah, I worry that robots or artificial intelligence will take over my job in the next 10 years. They may be tech savvy, but they're also scared shitless right now. <laughs> so a lot of this is just older people trying to flatter you, you know? And when I challenge you about reading a book from cover to cover, I know you do that, right? I'm, I'm just trying to urge you to take a self-critical attitude so that when people come up to you from the elder generation and say, you're so radical, you bring your own device, you know, you understand stuff, my son understands stuff that I'll never understand, get a grip, right? They are trying to stroke you, pay you less, and get you to do more, right? It, it, it's as simple as that. Now you're getting it, all right? So let's avoid that, please. And just while we're f having fun, you're taking it in good heart. I much appreciate that. I, I, I really do. You, the important thing in all of this is to tolerate idiots, but also to judge them. Right? Let... <laughs> no, I'm serious. That's... That's a Voltairean principle. You know, give them a platform to make a fool of themselves, but there might be something in it, and you will find that honing your own skills, including your polemical skills, will do you a favor, right? Because it will separate wheat from the chaff. Well, while we're doing that, can we avoid any more reference to the sharing economy, otherwise known as a, an expensive ride with Uber in the rain? Right? That's all it amounts to. Plus Airbnb, when it's not devastating Brighton and Barcelona and so on. The other examples for the 
sharing economy, uh, sharing dog walking, which is obviously the cure to the productivity crisis uh, in the West. And in fact, you know, there, there's some real downsides in it all, which other people have noticed. Thankfully, you've not talked about this, but it's fairly important. So, well, you're, you're, I'm glad you're having fun. Then we'll get to the ABCs of forecasting in a second. But all of this is to clear the ground, or what we used to say at Sussex, free your mind, man. But uh, it's, not as, it's not as dopey as that, right? It is being cautious about business fads, particularly those that, and we've heard a gratifying amount about it, that involve employers to staff, right? Because... Um, the new mission of the office is not to create wealth, productivity, innovation, and all of that. It's to stay calm, right? And it's to keep calm and be resilient, you know, be able to future-proof yourself against impossible shocks. And what we're missing there is the idea that we can create the future, you can create the future. It isn't just about the future messing you up. It's about you molding the future. And therefore, this isn't good enough. I mean, it's reflected in, you know, what's happened with the modern office in terms of rhetoric and in terms of architects, which is the whole religion of wellness. You know, I thought the office was to, as I say, to make wealth. I now understand it's a hospital, right? And, uh, you know, that, well, no more lifts, no more lifts. You've all got to take the stairs, you know. And we also know, don't we, the key to productivity is if you have the right staff canteen, and you are well, and you also um, start measuring happiness, like David Cameron did, and the, the royal couple of his day, then we know we'll solve the productivity crisis, because happier, well-fed, fitter staff, that means a way forward for the modern office. I thought it was to do with better IT, better air conditioning, better control of light, or as we'll see, acoustics. So I just want to say that the reason for you to be cautious about boosting IT in an uncritical way, in a way that doesn't interrogate these categories, is that your own profession may fall vulnerable, if you're not careful, to what has happened to IT. IT used to be a good thing when it got Obama elected, many people said. But now, as we know, it's an absolute scourge all around humanity. Right? It's suddenly the sociology of IT Right, not who's employed there, but how we perceive it, has completely changed. And now everybody is very worried that IT is going to really mess with uh, minds. And we can look forward in the next uh, American election to Alec Baldwin being a, in, in a fake video as Donald Trump. And, you know, we can also look forward, no doubt, to some much more devastating hacks uh, in IT systems. So we've got all of this legitimacy crisis in the IT sector, and therefore it's incumbent upon you not to go boosting, but to look, and to, uh, look at other bits of the world and raise questions that you wouldn't normally do. I mean, if you take the workplace, which is rather important, right? If you look at the changes there, not a whole lot of them are to do with IT. They're not even to do with the space space and the layout and all of that business. And, uh, everything, or wellness. They are about different ways of making you work harder and also a sense of anomie and estrangement from the world of work. So we'll find that the sociological changes are much quicker, much less noticed. Even before Me Too, the whole media campaign, social media campaign about Me Too, the open plan office was facing an indictment as a site for sexual harassment. So no more open plan, it's back to cellular, except the trouble with cellular is you never know what's going on behind closed doors. So you can see that, you know, the office is a site for charged debates about sexual harassment, not necessarily for rapid change in IT. So that brings me to a, an important, it's the sixth imperative uh, that I bring to you today, which is you're good at technology, you need to get better at sociology. You're good at UX, but the wider sociological trends to do with legitimacy crisis, the management demand for agility in the middle of a productivity slowdown, that's very important. Now, one thing I really didn't quite so agree with uh, Will about, and I think we owe it to Katie Taylor, is UX is all about reducing risk. 
And obviously, I understand, you know, from a commercial point of view in particular, how you can get an audience, uh, Will and Danny, uh, Will and Kate, Katie, to Kate, Katie, Danny, Willie. Uh, you, can get, you can get an audience from management. You go up to management and you say, look, you know that new innovation you've got? I can de-risk it. They're going to love you to death, right? But you and I know that there's a fine line between managing your risk being averse to risk, and being obsessive about risk. Right? So I'm not saying there aren't risks. On the contrary, I think there are risks. I ask you to interrogate the risks, especially as ri risk aversion and risk obsession can be inimical to innovation, because innovation is about taking risks. Right? So let's not get too apprehensive about the future. We already saw Prince Charles has been proved wrong. And I just want to say that although I believe in climate change, and I don't like Donald Trump, I can't go along with comparing him, uh, him with the 30s or the latest intergovernmental panel, it's a government report on climate change, suggesting that you know, we're pretty much unable to adjust to a sea level rise of about 72 centimeters in the next 82 years. So it's less than a centimetre a year. Are we really saying, a government's really saying, because not necessarily scientists are saying, that we cannot build sea defences in Brighton as elsewhere and in developing countries at that rate over the next 82 years? We're, we're, we're confident we can't do it. Well, I'm not confident we can't do it. I think we probably could do it if we push it. I'd be a bit more confident in the IPCC's recommendations if they could produce a front cover that you could read on their website, you know, but <laughs> never mind. So I just want to get this risk in perspective, you know, and I'll, I'll draw your attention. One of the big risks that is very much individualized, which you'll know about, is a medicalization of social problems, is that you're all going to die from tons of horrible diseases, right? And this is The Guardian in 1999, it's nearly 20 years ago, saying most of you should be dead from mad cow disease, right? And if EU scientists said it, well, it must be true. Look at all the other things you're supposed to be dead from. ADHD is what you've got listening to me. <laughs> then you've got <coughs> all of these different things, all of these nasty phthalates, anybody? They're in Apple iPhones, a piece of plastic. The EU has determined that if you are in a bath and your rubber duck is made of phthalates, if you lick it for 200 years, <laughs> you will become a laboratory rat. All right? So, you know, there's all that. And the only thing to ask in this is why are life expectancies for people who are 65, like me, rising, and have been rising very, until very recently. And, uh, you know, around the world, they've been rising. Why are we all getting taller like the Dutch? Are we averse to everything that requires any kind of change? And as we know, fracking has killed thousands of people in the United States, absolutely thousands. The law courts are completely brimming with people who've died, or relatives of people who've died from fracking. So I just want to say that, you know, there is a big climate of apprehension, of exaggeration, uh, and a kind of almost a nervous delight from our middle class friends that things suddenly look really interesting if catastrophic. You know, can we bring on the Brexit crisis? Can we really have no insulin coming to our hospitals? You know, and it's all going to be, we're going to go into the sea. If you buy into all of that climate, some of it is justified, some not, then, uh, you know, I think you can see that it's not going to help the cause of innovation. There are many barriers to innovation, which we often don't hear about. There are economic ones, there are management myopia, uh, and all of the uh, army of lawyers preventing in innovation. But it's the you can't do that philosophy from financial directors and even from techie engineers. We tried that. It didn't work. Stop it. Right? That's not going to help the cause of UX. And you find very similar phenomena in uh, barriers to automation. I will do a wager with you, with drinks later, about whether you'll see autonomous cars that you own in your lifetime. And I will make another wager with you about whether you'll see robo-taxis in Soho on a rainy Saturday night delivering everybody to the right party. Oh, yeah, right. 
So there are these barriers to it, particularly when you've got a crisis of capital investment and productivity in the West. So the imperatives for you, back at the studio, is to draw up, you know, what's a real risk and what's an imagined risk? You know, will your mobile phone staying on in the a luggage compartment of a Ryanair flight actually lead to a crash? Has that never happened before? But if you leave it on, you'll crash. Actually, no, you know, so let's assess it. And very importantly, the formative stuff uh, is important. But testing ideas, testing UXs in practice with prototypes, very important. So we're on the downhill straight. Let me just um, warn you that a word we haven't heard today is Asia. Asia, for, you know, you know I, I know Theresa May doesn't know where exports to China really will be headed, you know, because she's still finding it on the map. But you can't afford to make that mistake. So Asia. This is the user interface at Reliance Industries, Jam Nagar in northern India. It handles 1% of the world's oil from this site. The installation is by Barco from Belgium. And uh, maybe your labs in 10, 15 years will look like this. This is B2B. But it's interesting that it's India that's pioneering that, or even Tiananmen Square in China with the Stalinist loudspeakers telling you what to think, they really are quite into UX down there. Here's a building that's a cinema at the same time. So bigger screens, bigger UX issues. And look what they're doing in China. Some of it is really bad, like their own police Google Glass to do all that face recognition that you've been hearing about and seeing about. But did you know that in Fudan University and uh, with um, Alibaba, uh, cats, they are um, able to make a hat that will cast infrared over your face so that users can outwit the Chinese cops. Now, that's terrific in my book. In fact, it goes so far, you can not only disguise your face with this infrared baseball cap, but you can, in fact, become Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt uh, at the same time. So, you know, they are pioneering. And uh, let me ask, how many of you read China Daily? Right, OK, well, you get the point, right? You don't have to believe any of it any more than I believe the Daily Mail, the Guardian, or any of them. But if you look at what's happening, if you research research, which is what this has been about today, if you look at the OECD, broadly the West, they're spending a little bit more than 2% on research and development as a percentage of GDP. Well, Korea, <laughs> double that. China, heading for it quite fast. Okay. Uh, Japan, nearly double that. And um, we could discuss how, how little that's done for the Japanese economy. But we know one thing, which is that in America, it's been a bit stagnant. If we can just get the image before it goes. And yeah, there we are. And then uh, the European Union, it's underneath that. Uh, OECD average. And of course, the worst one is Britain, which is about 1.7. I couldn't put it in because I was so ashamed. So, uh, <laughs> you know, if you look at what's happening, the locus for innovation, including IT innovation, has shifted to the east. And you can see it in the growth of robots, especially in China. It, it, very few robots, given that there are 200 million unemployed in the world. But you can see it in what Alibaba is doing in R&D all around the world, Singapore, and, uh, but also well outside Asia, natural language, Internet of Things. See it in terms of you book a, a long haul travel trip with airlines in China, you do it with your mobile. You uh, want to go with um, booking.com, it's in bed with China Mobile in a link up that nobody knows about. So really, Please orientate more than you're doing if you want to enter forecasting and help management with that bigger stuff, that longer term stuff, that more strategic quote unquote stuff. Orientate more to Asia. They are not, you should. And I'm sure the China, we heard a little bit about the Chinese UX community. Very quick point and then we're nearly done. Uh, algebra in forecasting, everybody, beats the arithmetic. arithmetic. The basic premises from which you start are the most important part 
of the forecasting exercise, not the arithmetical results or, that you get at the end of it. So tell me, what's wrong with this map? Very easy. Anybody? It's an RAC map telling me I can drive from London and kiss Jean-Paul Juncker in four hours, 50 minutes, and 45 seconds. Did you get that? Right? Not 44 seconds, no, 45. Many of you will be in organizations all to do with the spaghetti and the internal emails that completely live or die by numbers. And there's a spurious scientificity about most of these arithmetical results. How did they get that result? That's the question. What were the premises? So the forecasting algebra, the basic sort of table footy columns and rows of spreadsheets and all of that in modeling, if you like, that's more important than the actual results. Got to question those results. So really, the most difficult bit of forecasting, and this is I just I'll give an example on this and then I'm done, is to recognize that for every reaction, that for every action, there's a reaction. And that the world is not unnecessarily complex, but in its totality, there are opposing forces that can often be contradictory and that can produce, when they're put together, a new result that contains elements of continuity from the past, but has something genuinely new about it. So if you take one thing that didn't come up in the conference, very important, not just because of Alexa in the home, is the power of the voice in the UX of tomorrow. Now you'll know about, better than me, Google Duplex, where you can uh, give an instruction and delegate things rather than just asking questions, where it will phone 20 people uh, you know, and tell them that there's a party on in a really sophisticated kind of way, we're going to see a lot more voice interfaces, aren't we, in the future. And it's got a lot going for it because you can actually input uh, or output voice very quickly, even if you're not saying anything at all important like that, right? Much better than a keyboard. But there's a problem, which is in these open plan offices where Europe is strong, can you actually hear yourself think when everybody else is using voice more than ever before in an open plan office? So really, the, what that means is that there's a counter tendency to the spread of voice in the workplace, which is what's happening in the acoustics of the workplace, and not inconsequential matter. Very impressed by some of the speakers interviewing people in their homes and the, you know, the five hours to fill out a visa. Uh, if the phone's going all the time, a bit like the voice interface of tomorrow is going all the time, then you can understand the five hours. Well, it's got even worse for the future, long term, because it's not just tech-savvy millennials who will be in the workforce in the future. It's going to be more and more older people, right? more and more people in semi-retirement who are still coming back to work, and also older people in customer service roles that uh, we can expect a lot more of. So, more and more of them will be, I'm sorry, they'll be wearing hearing aids. They'll be wearing hearing aids because that's a strong preventative cure. It's uh, recent research has suggest, uh, suggested against dementia. So you've got more hearing aids. You've got more acoustic pods, maybe. You may follow Kia in the acoustics of the office by isolating particular sound zones like they're doing in a car so they can have your own soundscape. And then you can also imagine that Google Earth will then eventually prepare a kind of soundscape for a conference like this, or a user interface environment. It'll produce a digital twin, or companies will produce digital twins of buildings that also give you their acoustic dimension. Quite important if the voice is going to be the high productivity, convenient, terrific interface, the universal interface, of tomorrow. And you'll be up against a dispute with architects and facilities management, and all management generally. They'll say, look, you know, fix the acoustics of the building. You'll be saying, no, we've got to start from the users. So there's a uh, simple example of a tendency towards voice interfaces, a counter tendency, acoustic problems, especially for oldies. Then finally, maybe technology can solve some of those problems, but you're going to get some resistance to the whole arena from a sort of non-user-centered point of view of management. You'll want a nice, cheap building with pretty crap acoustics. So here's the conclusion, very simple. 
Um, you've been very patient. I do appreciate it. Uh, Demis Hassabis from Deep Mind, I think, has the right emphasis on our intelligence, our autonomy, the things that we can do that machines can't. And as humanists, I urge you to take up that message, not because we don't want progress or can't see progress in IT, but because we're the boss. We're special. We make the IT. Of course, it makes us a bit, but we should and can and must have the last word uh, in it all. When Leo Sedol from Korea won only one or two games against Go in uh, a few months or years ago, did it, you know, playing a game, was that really artificial intelligence that the machine that DeepMind mustered to beat Lee Solo? Was that real intelligence? Did it really deserve a cover on Nature magazine? Right? Or Nature the Journal, I should say. If you look at what IT can't do, it's quite a lot it can't do. Right? It's quite a lot that it cannot do. Right? Uh, and you know, your laughter at my jokes, sporadic though it is, uh, un underlines that you know, we've got something that those electrons haven't got. So the good news is, folks, they're never going to automate you UXs. You know you're safe. You're going to go up the organization. Just don't be humble about it. Be ambitious about it. Take some risks in it. And um, be better than me on your time management. Thank you so much. Make sure you troll me, folks. I really want that. So that we can have a productive dialogue out of heat, light. Thank you so much.